Hello and welcome to the IET Bookshelf. I'm Mark Reynard, host of the new STEM Book Club series from us here at the IET. And with each episode, we'll be looking at a different book plucked from our bookshelves that we've personally enjoyed reading. And the authors will be then chatting with me about what inspired the book, its themes, and finding out what's beneath the page, so to speak. Join us with the author as we go beyond the book. So for this, our first episode, I'm joined by engineer and futurist Brian David Johnson to discuss his latest book, The Future You. He suggests that we can all become futurists too, building the life you want in your career, business or personal life. Now, BDJ is a friend of the IET. He's presented at our events and supported our 150th anniversary celebrations this year. But last year, he also co-authored our report, looking into how we could better understand the children of this world's ability to enjoy free play and inspire them to explore endless possibilities. A professor of practice at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society, he's got more than 40 patents and appears regularly on Bloomberg TV, PBS, Fox News and the Discovery Channel. So stick around afterwards as Brian will be back for a live Q&A session, answering your questions you can post in the YouTube comment section. So BDJ, unbelievable you can join us. Let's start with you uh, way back. I mean, how did you start? What got you into engineering in the first place? 
Well, Mark, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to, to talk today. As you know, I'm a, a huge fan and a big fan of the IET. So <clears throat> for myself, you know, I was born into a family of engineers. Both my mom and my dad were both engineers. My father was an electrical engineer and my mom was an IT specialist. So I was basically raised by nerds. And so I have always been a geek. I've, for me, there was no difference between storytelling and engineering and building. Uh, you know, in my dad's wood shop, we do woodworking. We actually built a color television back in the 1970s. So it was something that for us was just normal. That's what we always did in my house. And so for me, I didn't realize, I didn't know that and not every kid didn't do programming on computers or not every kid didn't do soldering iron work or things like that. So I was very fortunate to have been raised in, in, a, in a house full of engineers. And to me, that's what everybody should do. And, and, you know, you're, you're a futurist, but what, what does that actually mean from your perspective? Because there's lots of different kind of people use that term, but what, what do you see as the term futurist? So I, you're right, I'm a very specific type of futurist. I'm an applied futurist. So what that means is I work with organizations and individuals to look out 10 to 15 years. I look at a range of possible potential futures. I don't make predictions. I refuse to make predictions. What I say is here's a range of futures and then turn around and look backwards. And here's the applied part to say, okay, well, what do you need to do today, tomorrow, five years from now to move towards that future you want and away from that future you don't want? So, you know, how do you go from being an engineer and, and somebody who's studied all of that sort of into being a futurist? It was really, um, it came out of necessity. So what I had done in sort of coming up through my schooling is I had had this very interdisciplinary schooling. So I had done work in engineering. I started when I was very young, learning to do coding and doing all that type of work. But then also, you know, was always encouraged to let my imagination roam. So did a lot of work in filmmaking and a lot of work in writing and in research and in economics. So this very broad understanding of sort of where all knowledge and, and information kind of comes from. So then as I got out of school, and I started going and doing work. I was doing systems engineering, which is the type of engineer that I am. And it became out of necessity. So first off, I was designing set-top boxes actually in the UK and in Scandinavia. This is way back in the 1990s where you would take a cable box and plug a phone line into the back of it. And you would have interactive television, if you can remember back to those times. And so it took us about four years to design that, the hardware, the software. But also because it was the UK, we had to understand government regulations. We had to understand the television industry. We had to understand all these kind of interdisciplinary ways. And so we were designing platforms that not only had to understand hardware and software, but had to say, well, what might the regulations be in four years? What might the business climate be like in four years? So that kind of started me by necessity saying, okay, we need to start planning for this. And so I started using the tools of being a futurist and thinking like a futurist. And then when I was hired by the Intel Corporation, they said, hey, it takes us 10 years to make a microprocessor, to make a chip. Do you think you can look, you did four years, can you do 10 years? And I said, well, yeah, I really do think I can. And again, it was really based in engineering. It was just saying, we need to engineer these systems and it take us 10 years to build them. So how do we use the tools of futurism to actually make sure that we're engineer right solution? And I mean, you've written a few books now, haven't you, BDJ? And, 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 but, but this one, what, what did you, I mean, what made you go into writing a book that, um, to some people be a self-help book um, and uh, and what sort of sort of how did you get into that kind of area of book writing? So that's a it's a great question because it's it was a, a really different type of project for me. So, you know, again, I've spent so long working with large corporations, working with governments and militaries doing this work, but doing it on a very broad scale. But what was interesting is over the years, you know, I like talking to people about the future. You know, that's why I like doing the work with IET. I just like talking to people about the future. I'm just excited about it. And so people would ask me, they would pull me aside. And oftentimes it would be parents would pull me aside and say, hey, am I doing the right thing for my, my, my child? Am I actually doing this? And, and I would take that really serious because if a parent asks you about their future for their child, they're actually asking you for about somebody, you know, the future that they care about more than even themselves. And we all know, and certainly the work that we do at the IET, that that next generation is so important. And so I took it serious. So I would talk to them. And I spent many, many years talking to different parents and talking to different people and working with people. And people had a real thirst and desire to do it. And was at that point, so many people had asked me questions about education or career or finance or even love and marriage, which I was like, I, I, I don't know. And what I would tell people is, look, 
I don't know your future. I don't make predictions. I would never be so arrogant as to say that. What I can do is say, here's how you can think like a futurist. Let me tell you how I think about these problems and these things. And then maybe you can go apply it to your life, to what you want to get done. And that was really the idea is how do I take all the work that I've been doing, all the tools of being a futurist and empower average folks to be able to go out and do it. And it could be for their lives. It could be for their businesses. It could be for their schools, their churches, whatever. So and that was really the idea. So how do we make it so just anybody at all could go and start thinking like a futurist and really start to take control and understand that they could shape their future? And, and having, having read the book, um, and, and not being an engineer or a technologist, but somebody in the, in the video industry, in the TV industry, um, you know, I can see how I could sort of use that to help my future. But, but, but for an engineer or a technologist who might be tuning into this, could they use this, do you think, to actually sort of look at how they would um, map the future of their business or their project or whatever else it might be? Yeah, or even of their career. I think that's a big thing is to be able to say, you know, at the, at the core of it is to say, what is the future you want? Where do you want to go? Um, and there's some really basic ideas inside of that is to say, number one, the future isn't fixed. The future is not set, right? That's why I don't make predictions. In the book, we say, beware of predictions and people who make them. Because why are they making this prediction? What are they trying to get you to do? So the future is in motion. And then also the future is built by people. And that idea of saying you can build your future. So when it comes to your business, when it comes to a product or even what you want to do with your career, you have to ask yourself, who is that future you? Who do you want to be? Where do you want to go? And a big thing is that most people don't give themselves the permission. They don't take the time to do it. They're not given the tools to actually go and do it, which is, again, why I wrote the bookmark is to, because they say, no, no, here's some things that you can do. Here's some ways to think about it. Again, very systematic. It's a very engineering-like book. It's very specific around the processes. And it just gives people that platform to then think about and solve the problems, because that's what engineers do. We solve problems. So if you want to, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then here's a process by which to go about and do it. And it's interesting though, you, you say that the future is almost not predictable and yet you're a futurist. So um, when you use the word future, um, do you imagine lots of futures at the same time? Uh, so, so when someone like me is thinking, oh, I'm trying to think about what I might do in the future, I'm trying to kind of think of one thing. But when you're talking about here, are you trying to say to me then, think about more than one thing? Is that the idea and trying to think where you could be if you know whole loads of different paths kind of came together? Right. So one of the things we talk about in the book and what that I write about is that the future is local, that the future happens where you live. Oftentimes people will think, well, the future happens over there, right? The future happens in London. The future happens in Belgium or happens in Washington, D.C. or in Silicon Valley. No, no, no. The future is local. The future happens where you are. Your future, the future you happens where you are. And it involves the people and the businesses and the community around you. And I think embracing that to say, oh, no, OK, I understand that. Now, there could be a, it could be an idea that maybe your future exists someplace else. I, I joke in the book, if you want to be a lumberjack, you may have to move to the forest. Yep. If you want to be a, a if you want to be a fisherman, you may have to move to the ocean, right? So, the, but most of the time, you've got to be where your future is and understand that that's where it's going to happen. And the idea behind that was to give people the power to say, no, no, and, and to look around you and say, okay, how do I form my future here? And it's also a way of giving people back that agency to say, okay, what are the steps I need to take in the place where I live to go and actually make the future I want? So one of the let, let's let's really get now into the meat of the book. We've done the kind of general stuff, really, Jay, and let, let's have a look at this. So, I mean, early on, you basically are, are saying that everyone needs to think and understand how to realise their future. Um, how do you explain that whole concept then? This kind of their own, you know, their future. Yeah, it's that that idea right at the core of the future you. So there's the past you, there's the present you, and there's the future you. Yep. And so the present you, who is who you are right now, right now, right now, generally for most people, that present you, you're not being present you, you're being past you. You're actually thinking about your past. That's what we all spend a lot of time doing. Did we make the right decisions, great memories, happy things, sad things, all of that. But we're generally thinking about the past. And so the first step is to say, well, for the present you, you have to make that cognitive shift to think about who is the you, who is the person you want to be? What is the future that you want? And to take that time, again, to take the moment and think about what that might be. Now, when you start thinking about that, as I say, you will build your future. So you have to answer that question. I ask people to get really specific, to say, no, tell me details. Tell me about what it would be like to wake up on a Thursday in the future for that future you. 
Where do you live? Where do you work? What do you want to do? And it's in those stories. It's in those details. Again, I'm a, as you said, I'm a writer. I'm a science fiction writer and a science fact writer. Stories are really important because stories are the way that we communicate who we are, what we want. Nothing great was ever built by humans that wasn't imagined first. So imagination is the number one most underutilized skill in engineering. Most people think that that's a crazy idea, but it's really true because you have to imagine it before you can build it. And so you've got to imagine who you want that future is and start telling yourself that story and start asking yourself just really detailed questions. And that are the things that, that's in the book. So as a part of the process, there's just, I ask lots of questions. I, I like to ask questions. So I ask lots and lots of questions about, tell me more about this future. Tell me more about this future. And hopefully through that, and so I'm not giving answers. It's up to you because you will build your future. You answer those and kind of build out what that story is about your future. Now, I did answer, so I answered all the questions in the book, but we won't go into me because I don't think that's what I'm here for. But um, there's, a, there's a lovely thing about the, the back casting process. And I, I think that's a, a, a good place to start next. And there is a lovely graphic in the book. And, and for, a, for someone who is so uh, sort of graphical in the way they explain things, um, it, it was interesting to find there wasn't that many pictures. And I know, you know, people will be saying, oh, Mark needs pictures in the book and all that now. But um, there's, a lovely, there's a lovely picture. And hopefully we'll pop it up uh, in, in this video. But just explain explain to the viewers at home the kind of whole process with the back back casting process definitely so the idea again so the first step is to say you're going to make your future start thinking about that story tell that story that story is really important so that's that future you and then in the graphic we start talking about well what are the things that are going to propel you out into that future what are those forces those future forces that will propel you well the first step is you've got to figure out who your people are say well who are your people and we all know her team Who's our squad? Who's our people, right? And this could be your friends, your family. It could be people in your business. But these are the people who are really going to work with you to get you to that future. And that's where the story is really important because you'll go and tell people that story and have conversations with them about that story. And then maybe they won't agree with it 100%. And that's great. And you'll have a conversation. You'll refine it. You'll refine that story. Also, one of the things that people have told me that has been really successful with the book and the process is it also helps to identify those toxic people in your life. And we all have them. And, it's, and those are the people, we know who they are. They, they take your energy away. They say, oh, that'll never happen. You can't do that. Great. Get, get, get rid of them. Don't and listen what, to what, them. What happens if you can't? I remember this bit precisely. And I really thought about this. What happens if those toxic people are your boss or, you know, someone in the family? Or, you know, how do you get rid of those if they're, if they're intrinsic to your life at the moment? Um, is it possible? It is possible because you need to get rid of them mentally. So I don't mean, Mark, you have to like jettison them from your life at all. So we've all had those folks, right? I think it's, they're not the one. So I think for you, much like that, the, the mental model of saying the present you, the past you, and the future you, and you need to kind of think about, okay, this is the future me. This is where I want to go. You then want to go and identify your people. So to know that that person is not going to help you. So when that person says, oh, you can never do that, it doesn't matter, not your people. Like they're not there. They're not going to propel you forward. You need to go then to your people, the people who will support you, who will go through and do it. And those will be the people who will help you along the way. And I think for you, it's just to understand that so that, now let's be clear, when you start this, you know, we all feel it. So if somebody goes, you can't do that, right? You, you feel it, especially as you first start it. And what I'm trying to do is give people that process and that power to go, oh, no, BDJ talked about this. Nope. I know, I know who that person is. We're just going to push them to the side, and then you're going to go back to the people who will help you. And presumably, if the person who is the, the, the toxic person and is your boss, um, then one of the things probably going to be in your future is not to be in that organization because you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything, and you can't attain that future. So it will sort of start to guide where your future would be, wouldn't it? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And that's where it's, you may not even know your boss is toxic. You just might think your boss is not a nice person or kind of, and you actually, oh no, now in this framework, it's given me a way to think about them and say, okay. And that that's what you should expect of them, right? That that's what they're going to be doing. And you're right, Mark. I think I, uh, you know, again, I don't know your future, but toxic people who want, aren't going to take you to your future probably should I just want to put it out there that my bosses are lovely and, and I'm entirely happy. So it's, it's not, we're not talking about me, we're just talking in general. But anyway, so, so uh, let's go quickly back to engineers. You know, engineers, like you said earlier, are, are sometimes not the greatest at looking to the future. They're looking at the immediate and how to solve problems that are right in front of them. So how do we um, enable engineers and technologists to imagine the possibilities of the future? 
So I think it's going through, as we said, and sort of inhabiting that space. Even in the, in the book, I give examples of actually going there. So if it's thinking about the future of, say, real estate or a house or something like that, I tell people to go to the neighborhoods where they might live. Or if it's uh, going to uh, university, right? Go visit that university, right? You can go and do these things. So trying to get them to really understand that as you, whatever the problem you're trying to solve, the more detail that you can put around it, the more you can describe it, and the more you can have conversations with people. And then also another step, which I think is really important for engineers, is to think about what are the tools that are going to help me build this future? And probably more importantly, who are the experts? So who are the people who I as an engineer can go talk to who have done this before? Who maybe, maybe they didn't get this exact future or solve this exact problem, but have solved similar problems. They can help you. They can also, because again, you don't have to get it 100% right. You just have to start writing it down and talking about it and understand that it will probably change. That as you, as an engineer, begin to create this solution, know that you will refine it and you will refine it. And it's these conversations with experts will allow you to refine it and actually make it better and make it better and make it better. And then, Mark, to your point with the backcast, right? So then the idea is to say, now that you have this future, I think for engineers, it's okay, well, what do I do now? How do I actually, what do I need to take? What are the steps I need to take? So it's, this is the, my future. And I've talked about all the forces that will get me there. Now I look backwards and say, all right, what is the thing that will get me halfway? What is the step that will tell me that I'm halfway to getting to what I want? And you write that down. And then the next is you split it again. You say, well, what will get me partway? So what's the thing that I could do that will show I'm not there yet, but I'm well on my way. If it's a financial thing, it might be a certain amount of savings. If it's an education thing, it might be some coursework. If it's from an engineering standpoint and building something, it might be building a prototype or beginning to do the design. So that's what you say will give you part way. And then the final piece is to say, well, what do I need to do on Monday? What's the thing that I could do on Monday? It could be an internet search. It could be talking to somebody, a very simple thing that doesn't cost any money or very little time that actually shows that you're making meaningful steps to get you along that path. And you'll be really surprised that all of a sudden you'll start to get over that inertia and you'll start moving yourself forward and you'll see, hey, wow, I can really start taking these small steps. And as I take these small steps, it gets me closer and closer to that future. And you talk a lot about creating this sort of story, a narrative of your future. And, but should there be a balance between an aspirational future and, and kind of a more realistic future? Or should you keep it aspirational? I mean, and, and just a sort of subset of the aspirational, realistic things, do you have to keep updating it? That's a kind of key area there as well. Well, I think that's a key area, Mark. So one, I would say you want a healthy mix between aspirational and pragmatic. So again, we're looking at a range of possible futures. So you should push yourself. So you should, you know, as we should all have stretch goals in life and, you know, here's what I think I want to do, but it would be really great if I could do this and understanding that that can be a part of it. You want to have, again, that range of futures of where you want to go. And that's part of why you're thinking about this future you is to say, well, it's okay to have dreams. It's okay to say, this is what I want. And then to be able to go and talk to people about it. And it's in that talking to people about it where you will adjust it and change it. You know, I can tell you, I will never be a footballer. Never going to be a footballer. Never going to be a star footballer. It's never going to happen. But I might be a part of a unity league. I might be a part of this. So I think it's sort of understanding sort of what that looks like and, and where that might go. And then having those conversations with people are gonna allow you to refine it over time and refine it over time and know, just like with any engineering solution, that's a good thing. As you learn, oh, okay, maybe I'm not gonna be a professional footballer, but maybe I can go to a community league. Okay, now I'm making it better and better and better and better. So I think it allows you to be able to refine it as you go along. And you talk about, you know, we've, we've had future casting, back casting, but you've also got threat casting and, and threat casting. I, I think you've actually got a threat casting lab as well. So um, threat casting, explain that and, and, and then give us an idea of what the threat casting lab's like. Yeah. So threat casting is as it sounds. So what we've been talking about is future casting and that's generative. What's the future you want? Where do you want to go? And oftentimes, even in the book, I ask, ask people, well, you know, saying what's the future you want for many people is a, it's a tough question. So I also ask people sometimes, and it's in the questions, well, what do you not want? So what's the future you don't want? Because oftentimes you can say, well, I know I don't want this. Okay, great. Then you flip it over and say, okay, well, here's what you want. And again, you're going to what you, you, you're as aspiring to. 
But threat casting is a little bit different. So threat casting says, well, what are the threats of the future? What are you worried about? What's the things that you're really scared about? And we do get into this in the book, some very scary things. And so we say, okay, let's identify it. Let's again, take it on like an engineer. Let's identify what it is so that you can then say, all right, let's get into the details of it. So it's, let's get really specific about what it means. It could be something health related, career related, money related, but you got to get really specific about it. And as you start to write that down, then you start thinking about, okay, what are the meaningful steps I can take to make sure that it doesn't happen? And also, what are the things I need to keep an eye out that it might be starting to manifest itself? So it kind of gives people, again, that empowerment and that process to identify the fear and take steps. And the Threat Casting Lab, it's a, it's a really great place. So we have students. So I have students who come um, at all levels. Uh, we also do a lot of work with industry and government and military to bring people together. And oftentimes we do very big events where we get people together, sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 people, where we do this threat casting together. So a lot of those questions that you saw that got asked in the book, we actually work in groups and actually get people together to think about, you know, climate change, to think about uh, cybersecurity, to think about kind of big problems. And in the lab, we kind of bring people together to, to collaborate and work together on those. And then we have students who are learning to be future casters, who are learning to be threat casters, who are getting degrees in it so that they can then go out and be futurists in government, in industry, and actually go and make the, make a better future. I've got a really good question here now, which is, um, and, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's been waiting for, for, since I finished the book, but you end on a really good cliffhanger. So what did the girl want to know about the future? And can you tell me? <laughs> so that part of it. So she was really, really excited actually about being an engineer. And she wanted to know how she could get into it because I talk so much about engineering. I talk so much about where things were going and she wasn't really sure. And she kind of had this, she was kind of calling me to task to kind of go, well, what can I do? And I really want to know this thing, but yeah, you, you've got to, you almost ruined it for the, for the audience that the whole, it ends on a cliffhanger. Oh, well, there's and even that, more of a cliffhanger, which, which is, is that it ends on a number. Are we allowed to talk about that? Uh, it, it, the, the very last thing on the page is a number. It is. I'm, 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 and can I, can I, is it, are we going to give anything away? Can I say the number? Sure. Okay. So the number 25 appears on the very last line of the very last page. Why? What's, what's number 25 about? Well, now you're going to, you're going to see the, the personal side of this future. So uh, the 25 is actually a, a, a numeric love letter to my wife. Ah, oh, yeah, you see. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I, do you know, I was wondering whether it was something to do with two and five. Anyway, so um, the very last thing then. So you, you, you've had some great conversations in the book. You've included loads of them. Were there any that you thought, oh, God, this is a great story about people and about getting them involved in future that you just thought, no, I can't put it in. And are you going to share one with us? I would definitely, I would love to share it, Mark. I would, because I wanted to put this one in and my editor and the publisher were like, no, nah, it's, it's, it's good. They loved, they all loved it, but it just didn't fit. Because again, people, people will think that we've set this up, but this is no. genuinely the first time we've chatted about this. So, yes, so this is going to be brilliant genuine. then. Excellent. Yeah, because I put it in there because to me, it just showed how, how excited people get about the future and things like that. But it really didn't work. Because again, we tried to keep the, the, the book specific, applicable. How can you use it? It's, it's very very engineering based. It's okay. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. So there's no superfluous stories or anything like that. So the story was about people asking me questions. So, and I always tell, and as everybody at the IET knows, people can ask me anything. I love answering questions, anything about the future. And so I was telling a story that I was at this place called the Winooski School. So the Winooski School is a school for refugees in here in the United States. Um, and at the time it was Syrian refugees um, in Vermont. And I was visiting because I visit schools all the time. I love talking to the next generation. Again, we did it in the, the report last year. I did a listening tour going all around the UK, talking to eight to 13 year olds, which is still, I will always love the IET for allowing me to do that, to talk to these because these kids are amazing. And I love talking to kids about the future because they're so excited and they can't sit still. I, as you know, I can't sit still. I always move all the time. So I just love talking to them. So I was telling a story about people asking me questions about the future. And then I'm really good about... I, I love to talk about it. And so I was at the Winooski School. I was talking to a group of 10-year-old boys. Now, Mark, I don't know if you've been around 10-year-old boys, but 10-year-old boys are genetically designed to not hold still. They're just wiggle machines. They just can't stop and they can't. And I, and I get that and I love that, right? And so we're talking about the future and I was like, you're the next generation. What are you going to do? And these, they were really, really excited. And so kept it short. 
And then they come and say, are there any questions? Whew. Hand goes up right, right away. And I was like, yes, Leroy, uh, what, what, what can we do? And he said, okay, Mr. Futurist, how do you build a Death Star? And I said, good question. Now I'm, I'm a nerd, right? I love Star Wars, don't get me wrong. So I said, Leroy, let me ask you a question first. Why do you wanna build a planet-sized weapon that destroys planets? Because for those non-geeks, that's what it is. The Death Star, it's a planet-sized weapon that blows up other planets. It's that central to much of Star Wars. So go back to Leroy, I said, Leroy, why do you wanna build a planet-sized weapon that blows up planets? And he looked at me and said, because it's cool. And I said, correct, it is cool. Okay, great. So I said, let's do it. I'll tell you how to do it. And so there, so all these boys go bolt still. Everybody stops moving. They're like, and they start pulling out their pens and they're getting ready. And so I'm there and I'm like, and you can see the teacher is like, these boys I've never held still, right? And I said, okay, great. So you wanna build a planet sized, planet destroying weapon, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, where? Where do you want to build it? And they kind of look at me because they're they've never been asked that question. They're like, I said, well, you want to build it out in space, probably. They're like, oh yeah, yeah. I said, well, do you want to build it close to the Earth? Like, is it like, is how far of a commute do you want? I mean, let's get real, man. Do you do you want to get you know, out to Mars? Where do you want to go? So I said, maybe you want to build it. And they were didn't. I said, maybe you want to build it close to the Earth, right? And they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I said, keep a short commute back and forth from work. I said, great. Um, we need to talk about physics for a moment. How much do you know about mass and gravity? And so I started talking to them about if you build a planet next to the earth, this is not going to go well. And so I started giving them a lecture about mass and gravity. And you know, they Mark, they were just taking down all the stuff. And the, the teacher just lost it. She was just laughing. She said, I've never seen these boys get it. So they were so into it. And so I used it. I used how do you build a Death Star as a way to give a short lecture on mass and gravity for physics. So look, before, before we go, the final, final question is, um, you're a futurist. Um, have you future cast your own future? And, uh, and how's it going? So I write about this in the book. I apply it to myself. So I, you know, a future caster know thyself. So very much I do that. Um, I've done it multiple times, actually. Um, I write about it in the book. There's one time I had done it. The reason why I worked at the Intel Corporation, my, my overarching goal as a futurist was to um, go to Intel because I am a technologist and I wanted to change how we built technology. So the reason why I worked in Silicon Valley for so long is I wanted to fundamentally change how we imagine, design, and build technology. Back to what we were talking about before, Marx, because I think technology should be built for people. It shouldn't be built for technology's sake. And I wanted to do that. So if you could go to a large Silicon Valley company, if I could be their futurist, if I could help them to design the technologies, I could do it. And at the time, one of my mentors was the chairman of the board of Intel, um, a really amazing man by the name of Andy Bryant, very relaxed, no, not posh at all, just great guy. And so when I was leaving Intel, he said, well, BDJ, why did you come here? And I said that, I said, to fundamentally change how we imagine design and build technology for people. And he looked at me, he goes, well, you accomplished that. Obviously, you didn't set the bar high enough, <laughs> which is such an engineering response. And he was like, you need to, you need to, what's your new goal? What's your new life goal? And so I started thinking about what that might look like. And I really walked away. And this is what really also tied into the motivation for the book is I said, wow, we should expand this broader. I mean, that's one of the things as a futurist doing this, I do 10 years and I've done it for over 25 years. So I've seen it happen. I've seen the products come out. I've seen changes at the university. I've seen, seen changes in my students even. And so I realized, wow, I want to broaden that out. I want to fundamentally change how people imagine design and build their own future. I want people to actually take control and be able to do that. And that was really one of the deep motivations for that, the book was to actually go and do that. And so, so much of my life is really built around that. That's why I continue to work with corporations and, and governments and militaries in a private practice, still doing this type of work. I'm still an active applied futurist, but it's also why I'm a professor. So that's why I can work with the next generation. It's also why I am, you know, have a deep love and commitment to the IET because this is very important, the work that we're doing around getting people into STEM. That's how we're gonna build our future. And then the other part is I will continue to write. I will continue to write books like The Future You. I will continue to write science fiction like we, like my friend Will I Am and I did with Wizards and Robots. And so that's, I have future casted that for my life. And it's actually, Mark, it's working out pretty well. 
fantastic well bdj thank you so much honestly it's brilliant i love i love having our chats it makes me so enthused and excited when i go away um, but i know that the viewers of this will want to have loads more questions put to you so hopefully coming up in the next part we'll get those questions to you and you can answer them and it'll be fantastic to see what they say so bdj for the moment um we'll catch you for the question and answer session thank you so much that sounds great mark always a pleasure talking to you Hello, everybody. Well, that was the conversation that I had with Brian David Johnson just the other day about his latest book, The Future You. Now, Brian joins me live now to answer your questions about his book and becoming a futurist. Do you want some specific advice on future casting and threat casting? Are you curious about how Brian came up with the process? Do you want to know how we can be future ready? Then send any questions. There's three ways you can get in touch with us. You can drop a message in the comments box, submit your question via our website, and you could email your question to iet.tv at the iet.org. They're listed in the description box in case you need a reminder. Now, the first question we're going to go to today was submitted via the website. So, Brian, fantastic you're here live. Amazing. Great to see you again. Um, it was a great, great conversation we had. How's things? Things are going great. You know, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day here in the Pacific Northwest on the North Coast. Can't wait to hear the questions. So let's go to our first one. We had some. Can you talk through some of the steps and tools that will help us better understand the present in order for us to envision that kind of future and, and, and make it a reality? I think the most important part is to have to use sort of use your imagination. I mean, I think understanding today is incredibly important and sort of staying up to date and sort of having conversations with people, understanding that it's people who build the future. So talking to people and finding the people who are building the future. Now, those could be scientists or engineers, but those are also people in your community, in your family, in your circle of friends. So understanding that it's people who build the future, I think it's one of the things that, that's really important, but it's really your imagination. The imagination is the part that's so incredibly important. It's the most underutilized tool in business, in education, in our daily lives, is to really imagine who you want that future you to be. And that's the first step to really going about this, the process of, of building your future. And over, over the years, I'm just going to sort of follow up on that now, but over the years, have you reinvented yourself? Have you kind of changed the future you were aiming for? And, 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 and have you got there? I have. That's an, it's an excellent question. So I've done it multiple times. I have future casted myself multiple times back many long, long time ago, back when I had hair, more hair up here and hair down here. I was an engineer. I was a systems architect and I built interactive television solutions in the UK. Um, and I, but I wanted to work at scale. I wanted to be sort of bigger and wanted to sort of work. And, and that's what took me to the Intel Corporation is I wanted to fundamentally change how Intel imagined, designed, and built technologies because I wanted it to be human-centric. I wanted it to be about people and how people would use it. And I have, I have a TV background, an entertainment background, and a writing background. So I, I wanted it to kind of be that rich thing is to say, how can I fundamentally change that? Because if I could change Intel, I could change, I could then change you know, many, many different parts of it. And it could work at a large scale. And then as I was beginning to transition out of Intel, the, the chairman of the board, Andy Bryant, sort of asked me like, well, what do you want to do now? You know, you wanted to come into Intel and fundamentally change how we made products and you did that. Good job, obviously you didn't try hard enough. So what's, how do you raise the bar? And so what I said to myself was, I wanted to fundamentally change how every person, every average person imagined, designed and built their future which is why I wrote the book, which is why I'm now a professor at Arizona State University. And that's really, that was my, my future you, and that's the path that I'm on. So we've got a question come in, which is, how can I become a futurist as a recently graduated engineer? Is there a specific pathway? And that was from Carla. And presumably, first step, obviously read the book. Um, but, but after that, what, what's, the, what's the pathway to becoming a futurist? Well, the, I would, Carla, I would tell you, well, the easiest thing, we'll just come to Arizona State University and take all of my classes. It's very simple. Now, there's actually some great schools that you can go to if you want to do the education route. There's some great schools in the UK. There's great schools online. There's great schools in the US and even in um, Australia that are that are doing this type of work. And the programs are called uh, usually long-term strategic foresight is what it's called. And so you can go and actually get a professional certification in it. And so you can go and take some of those classes. I think that's one way. But really, and I think a, a much sort of easier 
easier way to do that is to start thinking like a futurist. That's really the first step is to kind of how pushing yourself to think about the thing after the thing. When somebody gives a problem or somebody gives you an opportunity, not only think about solving that problem or taking advantage of that, that opportunity, but then ask yourself, well, what's going to come after that? What will happen when I'm successful? What happens if this doesn't work out? And so really starting to train yourself to think that way. And as you start to do that, then you'll start, again, finding those people because people build the future and building that network and those conversations will really begin to sort of turn you into a future because you'll already start thinking like one. And the term futurist, is that um, utilized throughout the world? Is If you go to you know, India, China, Australia, do they have futurists as well or do they call them something else? It's becoming more popular. So 25 years ago, when I started this, people didn't like the term futurist or futurologist, right? Especially in the UK, right? And everybody kind of was very we, skeptical, right? I, we I spent a lot we of have time a kind of weird way with words, don't we? I have, a, I spent a lot of time with the UK press, people going, okay, futurologist. <laughs> and so people really were very skeptical. And I understand why, because, you know, back in the 60s and 70s and up and through the 80s, there were, it was a bit of a snake oil salesman, a bit of a, you know, flim flam, and people were talking about the future. And that's not what I do as I'm an engineer, right? And I build these things. And so I really embraced the, the futurist title. Oftentimes people, it's called long-term foresight strategist, things like that. But really what I've seen over the last five years or more that now, especially the next generation that's coming up, is really embracing it. That So when students come to me or when I go and give public talks, people really want to be futurists. And I even talk to parents whose children are going to, to university and, and they say, you know, can you really get a job being a futurist? And I was like, yes, actually you can. There are more and more places that you can go who are looking for futurists. And, and does it have to be an engineering and technology science kind of background? Or can a futurist come from the creative areas, the arts? Can you know? Are there people coming into futurism who aren't engineers, science, and technology people? Definitely, and I would say that's a requirement. I think it's a it's a requirement. If you have too many engineers who are doing, that means you're only going to have an engineer's point of view. Um, and so I actually do a lot of work with people who are come out of the legal profession, who are actually thinking about that, do a lot of work with medical folks who are doing work in um, ge genomics and synthetic biology, b those being futurists. There are a whole bunch of futurists who are artists and who are writers. And actually the, the term futurist, that's where it came from. It was an art movement back in the, the 20s and 30s. And these were people who were really embracing the future and embracing where things could go. So I would say it's not only possible, it's a requirement. That's one of the things that I seek out when I'm pulling together project teams, when I'm working with say governments or organizations or corporations, I make sure it's not just this, you know, middle-aged American white male engineer futurist. We actually need lots and lots and lots of other futurists to get different perspectives. Right, we've got a great question here now. And, and, and I don't want you to show the book you've just shown me earlier, which is one of my favorite books from, from the fact we have a kind of past that crossed over there. Um, you've got hundreds of books behind you and it's fantastic and we can't quite see the names of them. Um, somebody says, is it real? I know it's real. Um, can you show us your favorite book? Oh. My favorite book. <laughs> oh, that every baby is beautiful. Every yeah, yeah, yeah. Here he goes. Yeah, yeah. I'll do the plug. Don't you That's worry. You don't have to do it. Um, so yes, it's definitely real. I mean, here's uh, you know the, you know, yes. Yeah, so it is. It is actually real. Um, I think you know, if we if we're gonna go back and we want to go old school, it would be Future Shock by okay. Alvin, and this is Alvin and Heidi Toffler, and it, I always try to call this out because it was actually written by a husband and wife team, certainly at the time, it was the time when women weren't getting credit, but it was actually written by Alvin and Heidi Toffler, and this was the book that really popularized uh, futurist and futurology, and this idea of way of thinking, and a lot of these, I still teach this book today because the, the way of thinking is really important and they do a really good job. And of course they had a long career and wrote, wrote many books. So, but if you come and take my class, going back to Carla, if you came and took my class, there's also another book that I have all of my students read and you can see there's lots of notes in it. It's called Future Babble. It was written a, a bit ago. This is actually a UK edition uh, by Dan Gardner. And so Dan, what he does in this book is a scathing indictment of all futurists. He's a great journalist and researcher who goes back through and shows all the failings <laughs> where everybody got it wrong. And it teaches you humility. And this is what I use it with my students and anybody I do work with to go, you know, look, we need to do this. We need to make decisions about our future. So if not us, then who? And especially when you're doing it for yourself. But as you're going through and doing it, you need to approach it. And at the end of the book, Dan and I agree. I know Dan now. 
Dan and I agree that when you approach this type of thinking, you need to do it with humility to understand that, that you're not trying to predict the future or be the smartest person in the room and that you also are really going to depend upon other people. And you really need to collaborate with a broad amount of people because biology economics teaches us the more diverse those inputs we get from people, the better our future visions will be. So yeah, those would be my, again, these are the first two books you read in my class. So these were the ones I would recommend. Brilliant. Now we've got one here. It says, uh, this is from Emily. Um, it says, did you ever tell us and, you know, what happened to the girl in the story? Can't handle it being a cliffhanger is what we say there. So are you going to tell us? Oh, I'd love to hear what they thought. That's also one of the reasons why <clears throat> ending the whole thing in the cliffhanger, because one of the things that she was so excited about is she really, really wanted to be a futurist. And she was really excited. And, and that's the thing to me is when she came forward, which is why I missed my flight and why I missed dinner and I missed everything is because she really wanted to be a futurist and she wanted to know about some of the technologies that she needed to learn. She also wanted to learn, actually, she wanted to learn how to code. And she, so she wanted to know what languages she should learn how to code. So of course I missed my flight. And that's, that's a really good thing. I mean, I've just, I've literally just hot footed it from a parent's evening for a five-year-old. And uh, the teacher was showing us that already started coding. I mean, is coding a prerequisite for being a futurist? Do you need to understand coding and, 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 and IT and software and all those kind of things? Or can you get away with kind of not much of a, an understanding of that? Well, Mark, there's, there's two answers to that. So the first would be, no, you don't have to. It's not a requirement because you, can, you need that diversity of thought. But again, I am an engineer and I do have that background. And so I would say, if you you're going to be using computers in the future. So this is one of the things that, that I did with the IET back in 2020, where I wrote a paper around how can young women and men prepare for the future, get ready, what will the future jobs be like? And talking about things like, you know, future footballers are going to be engineers because they're going to use wearables and they're going to use fitness trackers and they're going to use that. So I would say that to if you're gonna use machines and we're all gonna use machines, it's like learning any language. So it's like learning English or Mandarin or French or German, being able to write. Um, all of those things are incredibly important. So you may not have to go out and code because arguably as we move into the future, actually hands on keyboards, writing code, the machines are gonna do that. Artificial intelligence and machine learning will be doing that for us, but understanding the language, just like maths, you know, you may not use maths in every part of your life, but the logic of understanding that is really important because you can apply it to other things. You can apply those metaphors sort of other places. Fantastic. We've got another question now. And um, what book have you read? And it doesn't have to be on your shelf behind you, but what book have you read that's most influenced you and your future? It would be this. So this I, I hate to tell you. This, it, this is the go-to book, isn't it, Ryan? This. Well, because it, it's such a it's such a sort of foundational work. I mean, I, we could go through and could show you show you many, many, many of them, and a lot of them. It's. I'm also a fan of very old books. I spend a lot of time in very old books. But and as you can always tell, the books that are really influential for me have lots of notes in them. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you see, mine has still got the notes in from when I read it for the actual interview. So that's obviously very important to me there, Brian. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time going back through. This is another Alvin Toffler actually doing profiles of futurists. Here's another one that Alvin and Heidi did on primaries and previous. So I think that was incredibly important. And then another one, if we can switch, would be this fella. Hmm. Mr. Arthur C. Clarke. So science fiction author, but also author of science fact, also invent, inventor of the geosynchronous satellite. Um, hugely in, influential around that type of thinking. And then the last one I will show you is this guy right here. Ah, uh, yes. So Isaac Asimov, also a science fiction author. I'm also a science fiction author, but also he was known as the great explainer. So you can't really see, but all of these books are books, are nonfiction books that he wrote. I still use them today because he would explain things so that people could under, anybody could understand them, right? So it doesn't become this professor kind of talking about these things. I'm not that type of futurist. It really is, how can I best express it to people? So not only they understand it, but they also get excited about it. And that was one of the things that a lot of these writers were trying to do was to be factual, to do the research, but also to, to go to people and not only explain it in a way so that they feel good about it, but to also get people excited about the future. So we've got a, a tricky question now. I think it's quite a specific one from Rob, which is how do you tell the difference between someone offering advice and refine ideas and someone that's toxic? Oh, so it's a, it's a test. So I think for you, when you go up and you're talking to that person, 
When you leave that conversation, do you have more energy or less energy? <laughs> Yeah, that is a, it's a simple way of doing it. Now, again, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, that's a little bit different, right? Because again, it's not that introverts don't like people. It's that they just don't get energy from talking with people and things like that, that it does drain them. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. Introverts and extroverts, both wildly intelligent, really helpful. But so you'll know that about yourself, but that's what I always tell people. Cause we know that when we leave, you know, having a coffee with somebody and you walk away and you're jazz and you feel like you can do anything. Those are your people. Those are your team. And the toxic people are the ones who just drag you down. And then if you want to get a little more specific, it's the people, when you tell them the story of your future, you, when you say, here's what I want to do. And this, I'm excited, I'm passionate. And I don't know if this is hundred percent true, right? Because your story of your future might change a little bit. And that's good. It's good. You want it to do that as you talk to your people about it and you talk to experts and that's fine. But if you go to somebody with all honesty and openness and passion and say, here's, here's what I want the future you to be. And somebody goes, nah, you can't do that. Brilliant. That's the, that person's a jerk. Absolutely. Now you said someone, you know, this is another question come in here. You, you said that uh, you said an applied futurist. Um, what other types of futurists are there? Yeah. So again, being an applied futurist means that I not only model the future, but I do it for somebody. So how are they going to use it? So was at Intel, we use it for chips. I do work with MasterCard. We look at the future of cybercrime and things like that. So when I do it for governments, we're sort of looking at, you know, how do we make cities safer and things like that. So that's the applied part. There are academic futurists. These are people who would look at things like what could the future of cities be? And they're big, big and sort of, and, and broad. There's uh, artistic futurists, right? Who are saying, what could it possibly look like? There's a, a great artistic futurist by the name of Alex McDowell. And Alex is a production designer. He's an artist. He's the one who designed Minority Report. So he designed that, that world for Steven Spielberg based on the Philip K. Dick novel. And so he is a world builder that actually uses his imagination to build very plausible worlds. And they are based on science, but he's not going to build them. He's not, hopefully you would, if you've seen Minority Report, we don't want to build that future, but he's actually going and, and sort of building those. So there's actually lots of different ones to being, being able to, and um, going through and doing it and using it. So uh, following on from kind of all, all of the things about sort of now and what we're seeing now, global pandemic, there's been loads of problems uh, sort of obviously health wise from that but we're now starting to see you know ships building up outside of ports on, on west coast america we've got supply chain problems in the uk we've got gas problems in the uk that have come with gas spikes you know would should business owners and governments have been doing more at, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic to try and sort of look into the future and use futurists and have you been doing work like that right well, Mark, that's an easy question. So of course, they, everybody should think like a futurist, but, but, but with all seriousness, yeah. So that is, that is really what I do. So not only being a professor, I do have a private practice where I work with corporations and governments to, to do this sort of work. And I had been doing it beforehand. I'd actually, I had done some pandemic modeling beforehand, especially in my threat casting lab at Arizona State University. We had looked at ones, and again, we weren't trying to predict the future. You know, so much of what we do and what we saw during the pandemic, and when I work with organizations, especially businesses, what I tell them is when you think about the pandemic yes it's a pandemic but you've got to think about it as a global destabilization and it's a destabilization of all our processes and procedures all of our supply chains of the way we get gas the way we move ships in and out the way we buy toilet paper the way we all of these things it's a disruption of what was there before and so and that was the thing about the the about COVID-19 is it was global because you need to understand the scale of it and then you need to understand where it comes from and this is a biological disruption. So the way that we get on the other side of this global destabilization is we get to the other side of the virus. Until we get to the other side of the virus, none of this ends. And that's the thing that we start looking at is sort of getting our handle on that. And we're all working to do that. But during the pandemic, I worked with a lot of supply chain people, a lot of folks doing that. But Mark, one of the things that, that was really interesting was this trade association I do work with, their supply chain trade association, they actually did a study during COVID to say, you know, looking at the companies who had done this type of thinking, who thought like futurists or futurologists, who, who thought like this and did it as a part of their company culture and, and embraced it. Didn't mean they were doing it every day, but they were thinking like this. And they found that the companies that did this as a part of their culture, they reacted to the pandemic between two and four months earlier than any other, the people who weren't doing it. So it gave them a much better strategic advantage. So that's part of it. You know, part of this is, 
it's a way of thinking, as we said, as I said, we said before, when I was talking to Carla, it's oftentimes it's a way of thinking and creating a culture inside of your organization and actually getting it that way, which means that you'll react a lot faster because you've already thought about, okay, what might happen here? What might happen there? And, and as a futurist, then, do you have to be able to um, sort of jump on board the change train? Do you have to be happy and, and free with, oh, things can change every day and it, you don't have to be doing the same thing all the time? Because there's a lot of people who are quite worried about change. And then there seems to be a whole other host of people who just love change. So as a futurist, do you have to be able to jump on that sort of change wagon? Well, I, I oftentimes I counsel people about change and you're right. Some people are super excited about it and some people are worried about it. And usually that has to do with power and empowerment because generally people who are excited about change and excited about the future feel empowered, feel like they have agency and they can see themselves in that future. As that change begins to happen, they can not only see that change, but they feel like they have the ability to change their life, to change their selves, their, their job, their family, to then actually thrive in that future. And the people who are generally scared with it don't feel like they have power, feel like that they're going to be left out, to feel like they're not going to be future-proofed. And that's my first step. And that's really the thing that I push. It's what I write about in the book is to make sure that everybody knows that they have that power, that, that everybody has that power to make their future or to take advantage of the change or to know that the change is coming and go, oh, I'm not that interested in it. And to make sure that you're still okay. But oftentimes I think the, the conversations I have with people is it shifts from that to saying power and saying, how do you have power and agency to then see yourself in that future? And then people do feel good about it. So, so, so I think the other side of that then is you have to be as a futurist, you have to be good at communicating then and being able to get it. If you want people to believe this new idea of the future and, and, and where it could lead us and we need change along the way in that process, then somebody has to be really good at communicating in that, in that sort of area. That's the bar I hold myself to. I tell, it's what I tell my students. And it goes back to what I said about Isaac Asimov being the great explainer. I tell my students, you can be the best futurist ever. You can have the perfect vision of what the future could be. And if you can't communicate it, you're useless. But it's not only just communicating it. If you can't communicate it to a CEO, a government official, a barrister, but then if you also can't communicate it to a lorry driver, a footballer, and more importantly, if you can't communicate it to that five-year-old, if you can't communicate it to the next generation, you're useless. So, so much of being a futurist is that sort of storytelling, but being able to sort of talk to people in that and to be excited about it. I think that's the other part. If you are excited about having those conversations, I love talking to a CEO as much as I love talking to a five-year-old about the future. Quite honestly, I actually like talking to kids more than I like talking to adults about the future because it's so much more fun. That's what we do at the IET, right? Is to talk to kids about the future. But I think having that sort of passion behind it, and, and it's really important to be able to communicate it. And that's really what gets people on board and gets people excited about it. Okay, we've got five minutes left now, Brian. So we're going to have to keep going quick here, Lighting but round. we've got some more questions in here. Can you talk us through some of the steps and tools that will help us better stand the present in order for us to envision our future and make it a reality? So I read about this in the book and this, here's the whole process and I'm going to do it as quick as I can because we don't have a lot of it. So the whole point in the beginning is to think about the future you, give yourself the time and the space and think about what that would be like. What, what do you want it to be like? Write the story. Details matter. What will Tuesday be like? What will you eat? What will you have for tea in the future? Like, what will that look like? Write it down. You have to write it down. I'm a professor, but it's important. Write it down. Write it down. Next, you start to identify your people. And we talked a little bit about this. Who are the people who are going to help propel you? Who's your team? Who's your squad, right? And tell them that story. And they may agree with you. They may disagree with you, but that's okay, right? As long as they're supporting you, that's where the toxic people come in. The toxic people, whoop, get rid of those. So you just have your people. Once you've identified the people. Next, you want to identify what are the tools? What are the things that are going to help you? It could be, you know, trade associations or advocacy groups like the IET. It could be an app. It could be a piece of technology, but what will help you propel and get towards that future you? And then finally, identify the experts. Who are the people who have achieved something like your future? Now, your future will be uh, individual because you're an individual. I used to like to say to people, who lives next door to your future? Like, who's right? Who's your neighbor in the future? Like, and go talk to them. And you'll be surprised when you open yourself up and start talking about the future you and tell them that story. Anybody who has accomplished anything in life knows that social networks are incredibly important and giving back is incredibly important. And so they will give you advice. And all of these things will actually start to allow you to evolve that story about the future you and where you're going to go and give you real concrete detail. Then you turn around and look backwards and say, okay, what do I need to do to get me halfway? What's the thing that will get me halfway so I feel like I'm, I'm on my way, I'm halfway? Write that down. 
Next, split it in half again. What will get you partway? What's the thing that will make you feel like, yeah, I'm on my way. I'm not there yet. I can see it, but I'm on my way. I'm, I'm getting there. Write that down. And then the final thing, what, what can you do Monday? What is that little tiny thing that you can do, that Google search, a conversation with somebody that'll make you feel like you took that initial baby step towards that future you that might be a little bit of ways out there. It's going to be a little bit of work, but that's okay. But it'll make you feel like you're taking those first few steps and it's going to make that future you feel so much more accomplishable. Brilliant. Love it. I love that. That was really good. Now, here we go. So we've got one here. Do you prefer writing fact or fiction like Wizards, uh, like wizards and Robots or, or both? Which is your favorite? All babies are beautiful. All books are great. Um, it's a really different thing. So I, the fun part is that I use science fiction and science fiction thinking as a part of my work as a futurist. And so I use that. And so it, because I write science fiction based on science fact, it's kind of it's kind of goes back and forth between science fiction and science fact. To me, now I do know that there's a difference between fact and fiction. Let's be clear. There is a difference. But for me, that storytelling aspect and using it kind of based on fact um, allows me to kind of move fluidly between the two. And for me, they're very different ways of thinking where one is being an explainer and talking about things and talking about where things are going, where the other one is a bit more leading people and sort of showing them sort of amazing stuff. And, you know, it allows me to be kind of over the top and use exclamation points a little bit more. Right, we've got, a, we've got a great one here, hopefully. So this is a specific question, okay? We're a food blog and we're at a stage where we could potentially go full time at a slight pay cut. Should we take the leap and quit our, our day jobs? Uh, foodies too good, it's called. So uh, basically it's down to you, Brian. Should they quit and go full time on their own project or should they stay running it part time? I would never be so arrogant. I am not a financial advisor. I am not that. So Here's what I would do. Here's how I would think about it to say, what will happen after you quit your job and you go full time? What will happen if you are successful? What will happen if you are not successful? So imagine the thing after the thing. So imagine the thing after this decision you're about to make and really envision what those two futures might look like and then backcast and see if it's the right time. See if it's the right time to make that and also see if you're prepared for if it doesn't work out. You know, I'm sure it will work out. Foodie blogs, I'm a foodie. I love it. I'm sure it'll work out. But what will happen and what will be the indicators along the way that maybe it may actually on the other side of that decision may not be going well because then you can start to take corrective measures. And it's also sometimes about how long you've got to keep pushing something. So do I give it six months or it's taken off? Um, or do I give it three months and it hasn't quite? And, you know, so there's all of that as well, isn't it? Planning that future sort of time scale. And what are the indicators along the way? So what are the indicators? And again, if you're, if you're doing a blog, if you're doing that, it, it could be you know, traffic, it could be revenue, it could be what's coming. And again, you'll know from a business standpoint what to do, but then also personally in your life, don't forget, it's not just about the business. If you're an entrepreneur or a small business, it's always about you as a human being as well. So what is important to you as a human being? I mean, many people, maybe you want to take a pay cut. It's completely worth it. Who would not want to write for a food blog? Great, but it's up to you. It's those decisions, but also honoring you as a human and also your family and your community, but then also keeping a, you know, keep a hard eye on that return on investment and where things are going. Brian, you know, that's all we've got time for with this episode. Thank you so much for joining us um, live. And, and thank you for joining us for our chat as well earlier. And as always, we could have gone on all night, I'm sure. You know we could. Um, but it's been absolutely brilliant. I'm sure the audience uh, out there have, have really enjoyed seeing you. Um, so, you know, The Future You, it's a great book. If you haven't read it already, it really is a good read. I recommend you do. Our next episode will be in October with uh, Femi Faduba and his debut novel, The Upper World. This is a sci-fi thriller that explores London gang culture and it's inspired by his own experience of holding a quantum physics master's um, and living in London on an estate. So it sort of juxtaposes those two things. Netflix has already taken uh, it on as a, as a, it's gonna be a film starring Academy Award winner, Daniel Kaluuya. So join us in October to meet Femi and find out more. Thank you so much again, uh, Brian, for joining us and uh it's always a pleasure and hopefully we'll see you again soon for some more questions and answers always a pleasure can't wait and again if you have any questions for me and you didn't get a chance to get them in submit them and i'll make sure to get them answered yeah absolutely if, if you've got the addresses there send them to us we'll try and get them over to brian and then we'll be able to get some answers to you hopefully in the future thanks ever so much brian for, jo uh, for joining us live and we'll we'll see you on the next show take care Knocking at my door A little too far I'm sorry for The lights went out Cause you kept cutting the cord And I started to fade Into your grave See 